Welcome, members and friends of Cornerstone Bible Church. A couple of announcements. Did you see on the wall there that uh, we have extra books over there on the side to welcome your return? So go ahead for the next couple weeks, take a half off whatever the price is in the front cover. No more than a $25 discount there, right? You collect and uh, take, go, but let's move them. Let's move them. I got a lot more underneath that we need to move out. Some new ones over there. Okay. If you are one of the ones that wish it wasn't your turn to clean the church, well, now it is time to clean the church again. So you had your break, and uh, make sure that you uh, start cleaning the church again according to the schedule. I talked with Camp Calvary yesterday. Um, The church picnic for now is off. They haven't opened yet. They will possibly be opening in late July, so they'll see if somebody cancels, and we might pull a fast one. Uh, This whole time is uh, full of pulling fast ones here, so we'll see what happens. But right now, it's off. Uh, Youth group members, please grab a trip packet uh, in the back there on the youth table. The pre-trip assignment will be coming after I get the book. The book is in the mail. We'll be working through R.C. Sproul's The Holiness of God. Uh, Because we have two services here, and to make it more comfortable for uh, different ones. There's all different things going on uh, here uh, that you see, things behind the scenes. Please uh, head out as soon as the service is over. Fellowship out in the parking lot. Stay there as long as you want, and do what you want with the masks out there, out there. So if you could move uh, out there for the next group to come in here afterwards. As we make all these announcements and joyfully, joyfully look around, it's special to see you all look around and be thankful to be here as well, but reminded of all that has taken place these 11 weeks since we last met together, much in this same way. I'm so thankful for the move towards being together, but reminded that it's the first of many steps and that it takes much work for us to look to Christ to see things clearly from where each of us are with feelings about the government, about health, about how to be kind and careful with each other, about what we are to do when we are at different places with each other. Our country is very divided. I'm talking to other churches and reading online, churches are divided. Some are saying, we could open now, but we're not going to open now because people are too divided. We hope in a month they'll be less divided. And we have divided opinions in here as well. So please remember that wherever you are, there are more pieces than what you are thinking about. And owning each that God has brought together here at Cornerstone as you're called to do as Christians will show you some of those pieces. There are right and wrong attitudes. There are educated and uneducated opinions. There are selfish and selfless responses. There are short and long-term views. And all of us are called to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This does not mean superficial unity, nor does it mean unity with each other, but it's unity with the Godhead through the Spirit of God by the blood of Jesus. It's a lifelong process. If you remember before the recent racial tensions and COVID, this was difficult and slow even then. So let's acknowledge the sovereignty of God allowing our faith to be tested this way, exposing what was already there before this crisis. Let's not waste this opportunity to bring glory to God as we learn more of what it is to love one another like Christ, being patient with each other, even as our fears, assumptions, and beliefs are tested by our coming together again. All of us, live streaming or present in one of the two services today, are called to look to God, and we do this now with a return to our Sunday morning series in the Gospel of John. I just have to take a few moments to look around. It is so good to see your faces. Over the last two months plus, there have normally been four other staff people in here recording in the congregation of my wife. And so to see other faces here, it's very special. How good to be back together as we come to worship the Lord. I have decided, uh, if you have a bulletin, I'm not sure what we did with them, 
But uh, it says in there that we will return to James, where we've been the last two months, as soon as we are able to meet once again on Sunday nights. But I've decided to go back to the Gospel of John, which we were covering on Sunday mornings. So John chapter 12, I'm going to read beginning at verse 20. And our text is a parenthesis that begins the second half of verse 36 down through verse 43. But I'm going to begin reading John chapter 12, verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I... If I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say, The Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I healed them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Amen. Message. John 11 contained Lazarus' death and resurrection. John 12 began with the events of Palm Sunday. These incidents included what we've seen throughout the Gospel of John, the contrast of amazing miracles and happenings and constant grumbling and friction from those not believing in Jesus. And yet Jesus continues saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He calls out, Father, glorify your name. And heaven responds. A voice came out of heaven and said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. While Jesus and perhaps the disciples heard the words, the crowds didn't hear clearly, hearing a thunderous sound, some concluding that the angels had spoken to Jesus. Why couldn't he have been clearer? 
Jesus warns of coming judgment, noting that Satan would be defeated and Jesus would draw all to himself. And the crowd still didn't understand. We have heard the, out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? If Jesus is so great, why couldn't he just make it a little clearer? For a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. To see this light is to eclipse all else, all our desires, our fears, our assumptions, calling us to worship for God's gifts to us and live in light in the light of his protection and care. So Christian, would you sing the glory of God? great God is for the believer, then why wouldn't we run to him? Well, perhaps some of it lies in the cost. Remember our passage? The seed must go into the ground and die, but then it bears fruit. 
lest you fail to understand that fruit only comes through death. Jesus said, the one who loves his life will lose it. The one who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. Your part is not merely to secure your place with God, but to accomplish all his will so he is seen in his glory. And this immediately reveals the heart of sin. What if we don't want his will or find his words leading to a worthwhile life? This denial of God's place, defining goodness and life, confronts us in our passage today. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. Even when some of the rulers believed in him, they would not confess it. They were afraid of the consequences. They loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. But even this doesn't stop the glory of God, as Isaiah says. He has blinded their eyes, he hardened their heart, so they would not see with their eyes, perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Do you know what this means? While we must come with our minds to Jesus, we must yield our wills to Jesus, you will not do this apart from him. Don't you dare blame God for your struggles. We heard about that in James 1. Instead, acknowledge the grace, the generous, undeserved goodness of God to give you what is needed to trust him in a saving way and to walk in the light. Worship his grace. Father, in the words of the psalmist, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations. And so, Father, we would do just that. And we thank you and we praise you again for this very special Lord's Day in which we are able to come together to sing praises to you, for you are so worthy. There's no one like you. The greatness of your creation, the greatness of your sovereignty, for you are over all. And yes, the virus. Throughout the world, Father, people sick, people dying. Throughout America, Father, over the last 10 days or whatever it is, 
cities in upheaval. The sinfulness, the animal nature of man coming forth. Yes, apparently very real police brutality and a murder. And yet, Father, the response in so many ways, showing again the sinfulness, the cries that come out from politicians abandon the police force. Oh, Lord God, we want our own way, don't we? All we like sheep have gone astray. We turn every one of us to our own ways, and our own ways are full of selfishness and sinfulness. Lord God, we need a dictator, and that is you. We need you. Sovereign, merciful, gracious, loving, just, righteous, holy. Father, you allow no sin, and one day your kingdom will come upon earth even as it is now in heaven. To you be the glory, the greatness of our God. Yes. Father, thank you again that we are able to assemble together, or at least somewhat together. And Father, we pray. We pray, Father, for your spirit to be free, to continue to move in our midst. Our hearts and our minds, I trust, have been stirred and will continue to seek after you. You know each one who is here. Lord God, you know where we stand in relationship to you. And I thank you that you have a word for each one of us. But Father, we would also ask of you, beg of you, plead with you. Lord God, the leadership of this land. Yeah. We've had it so good in America in so many ways. And that is because of you. Yes, founding fathers who definitely were much more open to your word. And a freedom to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. With our multi-religions and our multi-philosophies and our continued sinfulness, Father. We are moving further and further away from you. And Lord God, unless you, unless you by your spirit bring a revival upon this land, I feel our land is going under. God, we pray, may the church of Christ be awakened. May the church of Jesus Christ be what you've called us to be as light in a dark place. To you, Father, may we live our lives. Again, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for so many able to be back to work again. We thank you that the country is opening up in different ways. And we just pray once again for your guidance, for your wisdom, for your love, as we would share with one another, as we would share with those still outside the family of faith. And so we thank you now for this service today. We ask your blessing upon it. And may it be a time at which we truly worship and seek what you have for us. Again, to you be the glory as we sing, as we shout out your praises. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But also, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, our hearts, I trust, are craving, longing, looking for, and expecting the promise that you have given. Jesus, Maranatha. You may be seated. It's so good to see faces this morning without little rectangles around them. So. Whether you're with us here right now or whether you're joining us from home, we welcome you and ask that you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, which we'll be reading in its entirety as we prepare for our message this morning in the Gospel of John. Hebrews 4. Therefore, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, 
and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them fail to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David after so long a time, just as had been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Father, it just struck me that we began that chapter in fear. And we ended that chapter in confidence. And that's what I believe the warnings in the scripture, especially those in the book of Hebrews, are intended to do. To push us from behind, to run to you, in whom we find salvation and grace and mercy. May we fear sin in such a way that we always find ourselves running to Jesus and crying out for his help. As we look this morning in John at unbelief, We pray again that we would flee unbelief and find mercy and grace in the one who is the author and finisher of our faith. Father, we're so grateful that we get to be back together in the building today. Not exactly as we desire it, not the end stop, but a stop along the way in coming back to being your people, serving you uh, together as we should be. We thank you for the grace that you provided in the time that we were apart and what you're continuing to do to help us work around the necessities of this period in our lives. So, Father, fill our hearts today. As your children gather to feed on your word, we are thankful that Pastor John has thought about this passage, that he's labored over it to understand it himself, and to determine how best to present it to your children so that they can grow in grace. And so we ask that you would help him in the great task of preaching, and that you would help us in the task of listening and receiving and learning and growing. Be with us now and be glorified in everything that we do here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
You may be seated. Walk in the light. Live by faith by following Christ is not a recommendation. It's a daily necessity. Therefore, let us fear while a promise remains of entering his rest that any of you may seem to have come short of it. Indeed, we had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who hear. This is serious. Some of you say, stop. I can't take it. I can't do it. I will fall. I shudder when I hear passages like this. I'll never forget hearing of people when the Twin Towers came down, just begging to be put down, stop helping me. Not necessarily suicidal, they just felt they couldn't go on anymore. Leave me alone. Where's the hope in our passage here in Hebrews? What will enable us to be diligent to enter that rest? We must trust another. All your effort isn't to focus on you making it. The effort is to look to Christ. Why is there effort to look to Christ? Sin makes His worm seem not reliable and dims all the means of grace available to us even in this sobering passage, such as a penetrating word and a great high priest who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin, to whom we may come to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Look to Christ. Let His Word not merely fix your situation, but show you who and what you are not seeing. As we prepare for pastor to preach this sobering passage, behold your gracious God.
kindly open your Bibles once again to the Gospel of John. And let us once again talk to our Father. Thank you for your word. Father, it's a sure word, it's a reliable word. It's a love word, a reminder from you to those who are yours by being born again, to those who perhaps still not are yours. A love word, warnings, yes, but also it comes through your gracious and merciful heart reaching out to us, to our conscience, to our minds, to our beings, that we might respond in a way that would honor and glorify you. Thank you again for so great salvation. Jesus, you came to bring, you accomplished what was needed. And as a result of that, we thank you and praise you and ask now for that ongoing ministry of your Holy Spirit to each individual who hears. Jesus, you said it numerous times, let him who has ears to hear, so may we hear, I pray. Amen. Look, just leave me alone. Don't bother me. I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. There's plenty of time. Really? Change the oil on the car? When are you going to do it? Perhaps after the engine. It's no longer sounding just right. Fix the frayed wire? Yeah. Get around to it before the fire comes. Turn your life around. Believe in Jesus. Sadly, I'm afraid we've heard much of the above and others as well. Perhaps experience it ourselves with a stubborn streak within. Leave me alone. I'll get around to it. Reality is that too often we find ourselves forgetting what we were supposed to have done, losing interest, or perhaps the opportunity is gone talking to one the other day. Uh, they have a uh, graduate from high school within the family. And we've been trying to get that graduate to register for college. I'll get around to it. As far as I know, we still haven't gotten around to it. I can only push so far, is what the parents said. More serious than just a college application or a job need, or a frayed wire, or a plumbing problem is found in the spiritual realm. Death can and often comes unexpectedly, doesn't it? We don't know exactly when. If we're in good health and everything seems to be fine, too often we don't think about it. But this virus has caused many to think about death and eternity. But sadly, as we mentioned a number of weeks ago, even though we're thinking about death, far too many still haven't looked to God and what he has to say. I need to ask you this morning, are you ready to stand before God? Should something happen today and all of a sudden you find yourself life taken from down here? Are you ready to stand before God? What would you say to him? I'll get around to it. No, I'm afraid it's too late then. The scripture is clear, most of us know it. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. It is appointed, it's on God's calendar. I don't have it on mine, I'm going home today. I need to be ready, but God already has it. John Horgan's coming home on such and such a day. Are you ready to stand before God? I remind you, in life we cannot choose when we will come to God. The Bible is clear, and I'm not just talking about death, we cannot choose, but when we can actually come to God. 
The Bible is clear in John's Gospel. We saw it months ago. But in John chapter 6, verse 44, I read for you, John 6, 44, No one can come to me, Jesus speaking, unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to God unless the Father draws him. John 6, 44. And here in our text this morning, we read from verse 32. John 12, 32. I, if I am lifted up, Jesus said, from the earth, if I die on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. God must draw us. We can only come when he draws us. And so this morning, I want us to carefully examine these latest words of Jesus. And I want us to see the real eternal danger inherent in delaying one's response to his invitation. I mentioned before that our text that begins at the second half of verse 36, Merle Tenney in his commentary, he, he calls it a parenthesis. If you look at the first part of 36, uh, while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. And then you jump down to verse 44, and Jesus cried out and said, it continues. But we've got this parenthesis in between. Within the parenthesis, the danger of delay is the decision not to believe. The decision not to believe is often made in spite of the evidence. Merle Ter Tenney again, if I can quote him. Verse 37 here, he shares, the unbelief seems unbelievable. The unbelief seems unbelievable. How can you not believe is what Merle Tenney is saying. I believe the scripture puts that forth very strongly. Verse 37, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet, or still, they were not believing in him. I know myself, after sharing with someone and pouring my heart out in a witness or a testimony, trying to convince them to come to Jesus, so often I second-guess myself. Why did I say this? Why didn't I say that? Emphasis on me. And I remind you, only God can draw anyone. And he uses frail instruments. Prayerfully, our hearts are burdened for others and where they are eternally. Though he had performed, this is Jesus, signs. The word signs, uh, otherwise known as attesting miracles. Miracles. Signs is the word that John uses because it's like a road sign. Turn here. Red light coming. It's something that points to something ahead. I am the light of the world. Attesting miracles to back that up. The blind were seeing. I am the bread of life. We've been through those messages of Jesus. And he fed the multitudes with the boy's little lunch. Miracle. And he proves what he says and who he is. Not just for our bellies, but the very need of our heart. And that which comforts, encourages, challenges as he speaks to us. He did so many, verse 37 says, quality and quantity. Sign upon sign, miracle upon miracle. Jesus walked around doing good. I've come to serve, not to be served. And he reached out lovingly. And he had done them with the lessons that we refer to and many more. Belief, belief is not that simple. Don't get me wrong. It's simple enough that some of you little ones have already believed on Jesus. And who is to say whether it's genuine or not? God within the heart works miracles in little ones who believe. Jesus himself said, unless you become as a child, childlike faith, we get so sophisticated and so skeptical and cynical as we hear the words. Most of us have heard these words so many times that they fail to have their impact on us too often. No, no. Decision not to believe is often made in spite of the evidence, in spite of what God has done, in spite of what he shows us. Belief is 
not that simple, and yet it is simple. But it's not that simple because it involves more than just a few words. It's a complete giving over to, it's letting go of the authority in my life. It's learning to trust someone other than me, but I want control of my life. I know what's best for me. No, we don't. Far too often. It's a moral, volitional decision involving the entirety of a person's commitment as one yields himself and gives himself over to. Jesus, I am resting and trusting in you and you alone. I cannot do it. The decision not to believe is often a continuous rejection. They were not believing, continuing to not believe, continuing in that life's direction. And until an individual responds in the affirmative to the call, the invitation of Jesus Christ, one is outside of Jesus Christ. The call to follow Jesus Christ is seen in a life that has changed and obedience is there. Otherwise, it's ongoing disobedience. For those back there, for many of them, Jesus has been traveling for three years or so, teaching, performing signs, miracles. It was there in front of them, but they were not willing to let go and to follow him. Ongoing, continuous rejection. But it's nothing new. It wasn't just back then. No, unbelief was predicted. In the words of D.A. Carson, it was necessitated by Scripture. And so John here, as he writes about Jesus, he refers back to the words of God through Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah had the same scenario. This was to fulfill, verse 38, the words of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our report? Isaiah 53, verse 1. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It happened back then as well. Isaiah saw it lived out. He was told, you're going to minister and you're going to speak for me, but you're going to have a very negative ministry. The crowds are not going to come. They're not going to believe. Who has believed our report? God. Well, that's what I told you. You're a success because you're fulfilling what I said was going to happen because of the sinfulness, the willful sinfulness, and the rejection of mankind to what you have to say. It started way back when. Adam and Eve created, put in the garden, given a requirement, stay away from that tree. <laughs> We've seen it with our little ones, haven't we? Don't touch that. How close can I get? We look back to see if mommy and daddy are watching us. Don't go there. Don't touch. Whether it's something, a knife, a fork, or something in that thing, you know, where we get the power for the lights. I don't want to say too much, but you all know what I'm talking about. We done do it. Bow! Ooh! Find out the hard way. Yeah, Adam and Eve found out the hard way. And all of a sudden, guilt and shame and exile from the garden as a result. It's nothing new, this rejection of the words of Jesus Christ. So why should we be surprised when they don't listen to our testimony? But praise God for those who do. No, this decision is made both knowingly and unknowingly. Some know very well, I've heard it, I know what God wants from me, and it's too much, I think, foolishly. And so I reject. I reject. And others just live along. God can't be upset with me. I haven't gotten the virus. As a matter of fact, I've been able to work all the way through. Things are going well. My marriage, we're still together. <laughs> that, that, that's something nowadays. That's something. God's not upset with me. Really? He wants a lot more from you than you think. He wants your all. No, it was Jesus who said, you are either for me, and if not for me, you're against me. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son does not have life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Life can be running somewhat smoothly, 
and yet the wrath of God, you will find out unless you turn. The decision not to believe is far too true for far too many, and perhaps for some here this morning. Our decision leads to decisions on the part of God. You notice the words here in verse 36 that Jesus withdrew. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. He hid himself from them. Uh, Jesus constantly is aware of, Father, your will for my life. Father, your timetable for my life. And he knew it wasn't time for him to die just yet. And so rather than to precipitate the forces arresting him, having him crucified early, prematurely, he hid himself, he went away. Jesus did this often. Uh, just, just walk through the Gospel of John with me a little bit here. You go back to John chapter 5, verse 13, and look at this pattern in the life of Jesus. John 5, verse 13. I read here, but the man who was healed did not know who it was, that it was Jesus. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. John chapter 6, verse 15. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, he has fed the thousands, withdrew again to the mountain by himself, alone. He withdrew, he left them. Chapter 8, verse 59. John 8, verse 59, as we see the pattern continuing. John 8, 59, I read, Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. John 10, verse 39, 10, verse 39. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. He slipped away. They couldn't take them. And then here in our text, in verse 37, as we read, they were not believing in him. He had hidden himself in verse 36. I remind you again of the words of God and his promise to you and to me. Draw near or draw nigh to God. You come closer to God. You, you move with your heart towards him. And the promise is he will draw near to you. And that has caused me to say many times, and most of you have heard it before, listen again. You are as close to God as you want to be. You're as close as you want. How close do you want to be? How close? Yeah. We draw first, and he is just there, inviting, loving, wanting us in his embrace. His heart reaches out. Whoever loved like Jesus... I've been listening again to YouTube music, my Norwegian, my Swedish music, and my heart cries out as I hear of the grace and the mercy, and you can hear it in English, but for me it's much better in Norwegian, but, but it's, it's the reality of Jesus and how much he loves. In, in, in Matthew 28, as, as we're reminded again, not 28, Matthew 23, excuse me, Matthew 23, I, I pick up at verse 34. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of them you will kill. Israel, God's nation, the Jews. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues, persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And then the heart. Can you just picture in your mind? And I have problems with pictures of Jesus. We don't know what he looks like, and he's not white, Norwegian, blue-eyed at all. This Jewish man from the Middle East there. But Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And then, and you were unwilling. You didn't want it. You're the teenager who, I don't want to be hugged by my dad. And prayerfully, your dad wants to hug you. Or your mom. No, no, that's not for me. You were unwilling. But this is Jesus. Behold, your house is being left 
you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The loving Jesus who reaches out even today. And he wants you to come. Your burdens, your heaviness, your trials, the things you can't handle. Hey, let go of them. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cast all your burdens, your cares, the problems. Life too much. Come to him. He's longing for you. But here we see. When they rejected and wanted nothing to do with him, Jesus withdrew from them. But not only does Jesus withdraw, if you please, but God withdraws the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I remind you, one of his ministries is to bring conviction. John 16, we'll get there in God's time, but in John 16, verse 8, he is to convict regarding or convince regarding righteousness and judgment. Truth. He is the one who ministers in, 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 in the inner recesses of our being, our minds and our hearts, our emotions. He can stir within. He works on our conscience. He brings conviction of truths. The Holy Spirit woos us to God. He shows us. But God's invitation, his ministry, there comes a time when it stops. Once again, let's just walk through the Bible a little bit. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Let me just read a bunch of verses here. In Genesis 6 and verse 3, Genesis 6, notice. Then the Lord said, My spirit, my Holy Spirit, shall not strive, wrestle with, try to bring conviction with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. There'll be a time, but I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. And he brought the flood. He brought the flood and judgment. Exodus chapter 9, we're, we're talking here about Pharaoh. Exodus 9 and verse 12, once again. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh has made it very clear. I want nothing to do with the God of Israel. I will not let those people go. And finally, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them. Just as the Lord had spoken to Moses, God withdraws his spirit of conviction. But you can turn to the New Testament and have the same message repeated. Romans chapter 1, three verses, 24, 26, 28. Notice verse 24. Therefore, because they did not honor God or give thanks, verse 21, they became fools, verse 22. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. God, get, okay, you don't want me? Have it your way. You can have what you want. How many kids don't? Oh, boy, that would be fantastic. How many politicians now get rid of the police? God may. Have it your way and see what the hearts of people are like. Oh, they're going to patrol themselves just right, aren't they? Just right. Breaks my heart to see New York City. I am a New Yorker. New York City, the Big Apple. I walked those streets. Macy's on 34th Street and right up through Times Square there, 42nd Street and so forth. I've, I've walked those streets. But to see again, just the brazenness, the rocks, the whatever, into the windows, people ducking down and going into the stores and pulling out to see what's been happening all across our land. God gave them over. Okay, have it your way. Uh, verse 26, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. How bad are we? <laughs> oh, if we're honest with our own hearts, we recognize what we are capable of that is not righteous, that is not good, that does not please God. The petty sins, remember, sin is sin. Sin is sin. And Jesus died because of our sins. Yes, God withdraws his Holy Spirit. The result of that, as we go back to John chapter 12, you look at verse 40, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart. God is the one. And the reason that they not be converted and not be healed.
God is the one. Ritterboss makes this comment here. Uh, we're not thereby blame, or we are not to blame God in a predestinarian sense, but this is rather described as a punishment from God. In other words, man makes his decision, God, okay, okay, time's up. I'm not going to speak to your hearts anymore. You've had your opportunity. And, and, and I remind you, none of us knows when that opportunity will end. These are sobering words. Result, God withdraws the spirit. The result, now you notice, it's not I will not believe, but I cannot believe. When I set my heart that I'm not going to turn to Jesus, I'm not going to bow the knee, I'm not going to break, I'm going to tough it out. There reaches a point when God withdraws his spirit from an individual, from a country, from a world, and I cannot believe. And we're not to blame God. Our rejection is the root. Our decision is the reason in what we do. Quote, persistent rejection results in inability to discern and accept truth. Persistent rejection results in inability to discern and accept truth. Isaiah was told his preaching would be a failure. It would not bring the results. And only God knows when time runs out for an individual. D.A. Carson says this, God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty is never pitted against human responsibility. Verse 37 should have, I quote Carson, such unambiguous predestinarianism is never set over against human responsibility. Verse 37, again, though he had performed so many signs, yet they were not believing. Verse 37 presumes there is human culpability. And verse 43 articulates an utterly reprehensible human motive for the unbelief. Verse 43, they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. They wanted to fit in with their peers, to be like everyone else, not to be singled out as being odd, fanatical, zealously over-religious, or whatever you have. No, this in turn leads to man's reaction where we cannot anymore call upon God. One last point. And this is the good side. How does one believe? Because right in the midst of this negativity, if you please, but it's a righteousness and it's a justice from a holy God responding to man's rejection of him. How does one believe? We need to see with our eyes. We're back in verse 40. We're back in Isaiah, the prophet. He has blinded their eyes. No, we need to see with our eyes. We need to recognize in our inner man. It's a beautiful truth with reference to Isaiah. Um, I, I've shared, it's, it's one of my favorite passages there. Isaiah chapter 6, the call of Isaiah. I'm, I'm going to go back to it for a moment. Isaiah chapter 6. It was the year of King Uzziah's death. Uzziah had been on the throne not just four years or eight years, but some 52 years, I believe. And uh, it was a time of prosperity for, for, for Israel as such. And now Uzziah has died. What's the future going to hold? And uh, Isaiah... He says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. It's almost like John chapter 1. John's vision, as he looks up, oh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 1, as he looks up and sees the Lord. Uh, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, and the angels are there and so forth. And, and he hears the cries of holy, 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 etc. But you notice his response in verse 5, Then I said, when, when I saw the Lord, I said, woe is me, and like so many, Peter, remember Peter when he realized who Jesus was? Depart from me, I am a sinner. Isaiah, I, I am ruined, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Isaiah saw Jesus? R.C. Sproul, quote, there is much in the text, John 12, there is much in the text to incline us to conclude that when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, he was beholding the pre-incarnate Logos. The incarnation, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Christmas, we celebrate Jesus coming and taking upon himself a body. But back in the Old Testament, Jesus appeared incarnate, took on flesh, not permanently, but he would show himself, reveal himself. Isaiah saw the Lord. And it broke him. <laughs> My mind goes to a song. <laughs> we shall behold him. <laughs> What's it going to be like? Can you picture? We're, we're going to see Jesus face to face in all of his glory. <laughs> Worthy we are not. Worthy I am not. But we shall behold him. But the heart gets so hard. I was reading in Revelation part of my devotions this morning. And you come to the end and the judgments, the bowls and the tr trumpets and so forth. And then you read. And they refuse to repent. And they refuse to repent. Hardened! I don't want to believe. I don't want to break. I'm not going to cry uncle to God. He saw the glory of the Logos, Jesus. The only way to get saved starts by seeing him in his glory. As I see him, I see my sinfulness. As I see my sinfulness, I recognize I can't do anything about it. That will please God. Again, I say he's the one who shares all of our righteousness from God's perspective. It's filthy rags. All we pride ourselves on what I've done for you, God. God says, nothing. No, we need to see the need. And when you see Jesus, yes, to perceive or understand with your heart, as we read there in John 12, to perceive, to comprehend with my heart what he has done for me, that he has done what I cannot do. He has died for me. He became sin who knew no sin. And then to be converted. To be converted. To be changed. Again, if anyone is in Christ, he is converted. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Because Jesus comes in and there's a difference that takes place there. Unbelief is not the final word when I see and I call upon him for salvation. Jesus, forgive me of this and that and everything else in between. Jesus, my attitudes, my actions, my behavior. Forgive me of what I don't do when I know I'm supposed to be doing it. Be converted, yes. And so to be healed or saved as only God can do, made new with Christ living within. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. I shared, I guess it was last week, again, how I'm getting sicker and sicker and tireder and tireder of hearing people who are Christian. The bulletin. It was a long thought. That's in here, in your bulletin. I'm going to read it again. Jim Earhart. I think he was an atheist in his high school years. And then he heard the gospel for the first time and got saved, and he's been a professor, he's been over in the Ukraine, uh, there at some school. Uh, he, he's been missionary, he's been a pastor, he's been a lot of things. But I found him again on the internet, and he shared this, the invitation system, and I grew up with it. And there's a place for invitations, maybe I don't give them enough. But the invitation system, quote, encourages people to make a response that settles things. And through subsequent counseling to never doubt that decision. Anyone who is involved in personal evangelism can share accountable or countless examples of persons 
who though presently living in gross sin, will nevertheless tell the evangelists that they are fine because they made a decision for Christ a certain number of years ago. With me, I've heard it too many times, and often it's mom. It's mom who speaks about their little boy who's now an adult, their little girl who's now grown up. And mom can remember when my little boy, little girl prayed and asked Jesus into their heart. You heard me say earlier, little ones can believe, and it's genuine, it's real. But I share with you, any child who has a mom or dad who loves them and they know they are loved, and mommy and daddy says, one day mommy and daddy are going to die and go to heaven. And mommy and daddy, we, we, we want you to come with us. Pray this prayer. Again, little ones can pray that prayer. But what little one is not going to pray the prayer, Jesus, come into my heart. See, they made a decision. They're forever saved because once saved, always saved. And you've heard me since I came to Mennonite country here. I said, yes, once saved, always saved, if truly saved, if truly saved. The thought, once again, they have never had any change in their life. They have no interest in the church, the Bible, or even God. But they have made their decision. Can we not see how dangerous such a system is to the souls of men? If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. You can pray as many prayers as you want and as many, how often you want, but if there's no change, if you don't have a love for God, a love for Jesus, if you don't want to be in church and to praise Him, the Bible means nothing to you. I'm sorry. There does not seem to be. There does not seem to be. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying it does not seem to be any life in you. And we balk at what God wants us to do or be. And yet I prayed the prayer, so I'm going to heaven. You may be living very dangerously. Again, please hear me. I'm not saying little ones. When they say, Mommy, Daddy, I want to ask Jesus to be my Savior. I'm not saying, oh no, you're too young. You don't want to ever say that. But you want to let them know what God says about salvation. And then raise them and train them up and encourage them to keep living for Jesus. Through the grade school and the junior high and the high school and beyond to live for Jesus. And if you see a life just like mine, nothing perfect will come out of any of your lives, and it hasn't out of mine. But there's a desire and a direction. I'm living for Jesus. I want Him. Even when I stumble, even when I fall, I want Him. I want Him. I want to live for Him. That's what Jesus is talking about. Again, the negative side is given through Isaiah, who shared because of the people's decision not to, to believe. No, it's sobering, but it's also encouraging to recognize that in the midst of a negative, there's also a precious invitation that we still can see here. Because it is not God's desire. Peter writes it, makes it clear. God is not desirous, he's not willing. It's not his desire that any should perish, but that all should come to true repentance and get saved. He longs for you to come. As we come to the end of Jesus' life, most of you are aware that there were a couple of men who asked for his body, and they were granted permission by Rome. They took down the body of Jesus from the cross, and they put him in the tomb of one of them. Nicodemus, who we met in John chapter 3, who came at night, apparently embarrassed, I don't want to be seen going to Jesus, but I've got questions that only you can answer, Jesus. And Joseph of Arimathea as well. It was his tomb in where Jesus was laid. But they came, because you read here again, they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. My friends, that will not get you into heaven, wanting man's approval. You'll find out you can't please everyone. We find that out now with uh, even coming back together. Talking to my friends from Harleysville, uh, Bible Fellowship Church over there. They've got arguments from both sides. You're not coming back to church soon enough. You're waiting too long to come back from both sides. They realize they're not going to be able to please everyone, the approval of men. You need to look to this one, to your God. Are you pleasing Him? That's what matters the most for all of us. 
Morris, in his commentary, shares, to love the glory of men above the glory of God is the disaster. Praise of men will not last. But to hear from Jesus himself, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To hear from Jesus one day, that's what all of us can have as we look to him. I encourage you again to make sure of where you're at in the direction of your life and what you really want to live for. If you're living for Jesus, it's an indication of reality on the inside. The danger of delay, you don't know when your last opportunity is here. Turn to Jesus with all that is within you. Let us pray. Father, <laughs> part of me says welcome back to church again. And then we start with a text like this. This is where we left off. 10 weeks, 11 weeks ago, whenever it was. And Father, your word, line upon line, precept upon precept, as we allow you to work within us, that our minds might be transformed in such a way that we learn to look at life through your eyes, a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview, starting with ourselves and relationship with you. Father, there are too many people who hear a false gospel. There are too many people who hear an easy gospel. And Jesus, you never made it easy for anyone to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to, to love you more than father and mother or wife or kids or whatever, our jobs. You, Lord, are a jealous God. And you want us to love you with all that is within us. Hallelujah. Thank you for eyes to see and ears to hear. And by your spirit within, to be able to live this impossible life of being a Christian. But you within, Father, <laughs> yes, you hold us fast. Uh, you, you within, uh, you will bring us safely, safely to the other side, home in your time. To you be the glory. And I pray this for each one here, that we would examine where we stand with you and give you praise for such great salvation as it is ours. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was going to say take your songbooks, but uh, take your eyes to the front, please, as we close out with a question for each of us to examine and then to sing it or just speak it out loud if you don't want to sing. But have you any room for Jesus?
Father, you have called to yourself, and you continue to call. We thank you, Father, for your gracious providence. Yes. Even as you work your plan, it is a righteous plan. There are those that will come and those that won't. You will be glorified in all. But Father, as we have the gift of hearing your word, we pray that you would receive the glory and that people would respond. Thank you, Father, for what you've been doing in lives. We're praying that we would go confident because the word of God is true. It is good. It gives hope. It gives direction. We pray that what's of you would be remembered. You bring change. It brings glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.